Okay, we have already quite many people joining in. So maybe we could already start uh, with the session today. But yeah, once again, um, thanks so much all for joining. My name is uh, Bikas Goron. Currently I'm heading events and, and people operation here at Inclusive and I will be the host and also the moderator for the, for the event today. Uh, first of all, of course, it's it's really amazing. Like I said again, uh, really amazing to see so many of you already. This Thursday morning, uh, this is the first inclusive talks of this year, and the topic for today is uh, the driving DEI changes in organizations. So among us, we have an amazing list of speakers, uh, starting with uh, Sumit Singh Patpatia, head of diversity, inclusion, and belonging at Sipstead, and we also have Minna Ari, global talent manager at Kone. And uh, we also have Yesmit Sanchez, DEI consultant here at Inclusive. So absolutely excited to have you all here and also uh, really, really looking forward uh, to the discussions that we're going to have for the next one hour. But yeah, before we dive into the panel discussion, a bit of a practicalities, event practicalities. Uh, the, the you know duration of the event is one hour where we'll spend the first 40 to 45 minutes uh, on the panel discussion and the remaining 15 to 20 minute, minutes will be left for, for audience questions. So during the event, uh, the chat function on the right-hand side of the platform uh, will be up and running and we encourage everyone to share their thoughts and opinions you know, about today's topic. And so do you also have any questions? Um, please use the Q&A function that, that is on the platform and we'll try to include, you know, as many of them as possible uh, during the Q&A session at the end of the panel discussion. But yeah, and this event will be recorded. And like I said, the recordings will be shared with all the registered participants once the event is over. But yeah, uh, a bit about today's topic, driving DI changes in organization. So in this uh, session, we'll focus on three different things, uh, starting with, of course, sharing what are the crucial elements that are needed to sort of like promote the uh, changes in organization. Then we will also look into sort of addressing uh, the challenges and the barriers preventing those changes. And lastly, of course, very solution oriented, identifying solutions and best practices to drive those uh, DEI changes. But yeah, I think we could start with uh, a very short intro from our speakers. And if you could also, you know, briefly share uh, your initial thoughts on today's topic. Uh, Sumit, would you like to go first? Yes, uh, thank you, Bikash, and uh, hello, everyone. It's good to be here. Uh, uh, and uh, it's good to have a Finnish audience, I think. Uh, so, so I'm glad to be invited to, to, to this event. Um, uh, so uh, I'm responsible, as Bikash uh, mentioned, uh, for diversity, inclusion, and belonging in Shipstead. Uh, Shipstead is a uh, a uh, global company, uh, may, mainly uh, now with a foothold in the, the Nordics and uh, Poland. Uh, we have over 55 different brands, uh, mainly then focusing on uh, uh, news media. Uh, we have uh, online or digital marketplaces and uh, financial services uh, and ventures. Um, so our portfolio is qu quite wide and uh, uh, diverse in, uh, in that sense. Um, so the agenda, I would say, also for diversity, inclusion, and belonging is quite different for the different verticals. Um, my background is uh, I, I came from a Ramble Group, uh, working with digital and innovation, um, also a global company. Uh, and prior to that, I worked in Telenor uh, with uh, uh, also uh, uh, with the transformation and uh, working on the transformation journey uh, for Telenor. So, so my background is uh, quite uh, maybe different and untraditional with regards to diversity, inclusion, and belonging because uh, my passion is diversity, inclusion, and belonging. So that's been my biggest hobbies. So a lot of initiatives, a lot of um, uh, things I do uh, outside work has been around this topic. So suddenly I saw kind of these things uh, intersecting. Uh, so that led me to Shipstead. Uh, which is a brilliant company to work with this uh, this agenda because I think it's uh, the, uh, we are ambitious with regards to this agenda and uh, we really see this as uh, an important key factor for our further uh, success. So uh, so yeah, and the topic today, of course, that's close to my heart. It's uh, yeah, I think uh, working with this, it's. Uh, 
um, you could say uh, something fulfills us with external uh, factors, something fulfills us with kind of internal factors. Uh, and this is kind of my internal passion. So it comes from within and uh, that makes me more passionate uh, in the positive and negative sense. Um, yeah, so, uh, so, so thank you for being here. Thanks, Amit, and, and great to have you here. Uh, how about Minna? So, um, uh, good morning, everybody, and, and thanks for the invite to this panel. I'm really, really excited to be here. So, my name is Minna Ari, and I'm from the uh, Kone. Um, I'm sure that for the many Finnish uh, uh, audience, this is a, um, a familiar company. So, we are the, the a leading company in the elevator and escalator industry, and we have um, I think we have over 60,000 employees working for us in 60 countries. And I'm working as a global talent manager, meaning that I'm looking after the, the um, internal global um, talent management processes and practices, developing and implementing those globally. And a big part of my work is then around DEI. So I'm also looking after the um, or leading the diversity and inclusion equity um, initiatives um, that we have globally. And um, the, I've been working with Kona now for um, three and a half years. Before that, I have a background in psychology. I've been working as a consultant and also in, in a retail company in, in Finland. And this is an important topic for me as well, of course. And uh, all that time that I've been with Kona, DEI has been a part of my role. But especially now that we launched our new strategy last year, uh, this has been uh, even more kind of in the focus of, of our strategy. So this is really embedded into our strategy. And that is, a, is a, of course, a huge thing. And it's getting a lot of attention and there's a lot of interest around the topic. So it's been really exciting uh, years now. and. Um, and I think a big part of working with DEI is to also connect to other people working with the topic and learning from each other. Um, so that's why I'm also really interested to be here today, uh, sharing kind of uh, thoughts and, and practices. So, so thank you for, for being invited. Thanks, Minna, for, for, for that info. And also really looking forward to hear more about more about Kone's initiatives and also your perspective on, on DEI in general later during the discussion. Uh, what about Yesmith? How is Yesmith doing this morning? Good morning, all. And thank you for, for the invitation to the panel. This is an honor for me to be sharing the stage with Sumit and Minna. So thank you for that. My name is Yesmit Sanchez and I, I work as a diversity, equity and inclusion consultant at Inclusive. For those of you who don't know Inclusive, we are an organization which actually helps other organizations to create uh, work environments that are more inclusive and that are creating practices that promote diversity. My background is in business strategy and that is what I have been formally educated in and that is also what I have been working with and now it is my very own privilege to also combine my passion and knowledge with diversity equity and inclusion and take it to organizations so quite an impactful job and something I very much enjoy. Thank you. All right, uh, thanks for the introductions uh, and of course also sharing a bit about, about your own perspective on DEI. Uh, let's discuss a bit more more later during the during the uh, panel discussion. Uh, firstly, I want to build up build up a bit of you know of the discussion by at least having a very general understanding of, of the current state of DEI in organizations. Uh, maybe I'd like to you know start with Sumit first. Uh, Sumit, on a personal level, uh, how do you see the importance of DEI in organizations at this point of time? So I think uh, it's about, uh, you know, in Shipstead, we, we have a vision to empower people in their daily lives. So, uh, I mean, that is uh, in the heart. You cannot, uh, uh, when you talk about people and you talk about empowering, for me, that means that you are actually uh, uh, including all kinds of people, right? So it's all kinds of people we want to empower. That means that we need to understand all kinds of people. We need to have insight in the life of all kinds of people. Uh, we need to understand the pain, gains, and jobs to be done for all kinds of people. Uh, that's the only way we can empower these people in their daily lives. Uh, and I think it starts with our 
uh, organizations, right? We, we need to have, we have to reflect that insight understanding of the people we want to empower out there in the organization. Uh, and I think that naturally sends the wave that we need to then have these all kinds of people in our organizations. And when they are in the organization, we need to empower these people in order to utilize the full potential of these people so that we can really tap into that potential insight to understand the people outside the company. So, so I think that's sort of the high level uh, umbrella for, for, for why I think this is important. And then you could, of course, look into each of the different business areas and see that there's different rationalities for the different uh, uh, areas. Um, uh, but the high level is, is the same. Uh, we will not survive. Uh, we will not stay relevant if we keep on delivering to the same homogeneous groups uh, out there that we have been doing. Thanks, thanks, Amit, for sharing that. Definitely um, empowering people and the workforce within the organization is one of the key areas that the organizations can do. Uh, I would like to bring Minna in. Minna, what are your thoughts on this, initial thoughts on, 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 on this topic? I have to agree with what Sumit said. It is about really the important aspect is empowering people and uh, empowering all kinds of people. So I have to agree that that's a, that's a big thing. And and another thing, which is also one of our strategic targets, is to be a great place to work and, and, and to create that kind of a workplace where everybody can be their um, authentic selves. They can really bring their uh, whole selves to work. And I think that is something that I feel really uh, passionate about, that, you know, um, I think it's so important that people feel safe to be what they are and, and that kind of then also... Um, um, gives us the opportunity to, to reap the benefits of the diversity. So obviously diversity um, alone is not, not enough. We also need to be really inclusive and to do that, there needs to be the psychological safety. We need to be able to be our authentic selves. And I think this then really, when we get all those perspectives in, when we get all that diverse capabilities and competencies into use, that then drives the innovation and that, you know, that has a positive impact on the engagement and also well-being. People are generally more happy. So I think those are really important aspects that then also really impact even the profitability. So um, there is this uh, clear link to, to the, the productivity and profitability. And um, maybe also one thing that I personally feel that is really important when it comes to DEI is that uh, the kind of equal opportunities for growth and development. I think for us to be able to attract uh, different kind of talents, uh, we need to be able to also then offer the equal opportunities for development and growth. I think that's that's a very well put, Minna. Thanks for sharing that. And definitely, you know, creating this sort of like the workplace where everyone can be their own self and also with you discussed a bit about psychological safety and also having the feeling of belonging within the organization is, is one of the, some of those key things that the employees want from one from the organization. I want to bring Yasmith on this one. Yasmith, what are your initial thoughts on, on, on this topic? Yeah, I think I'm going to echo what uh, both uh, Sumit and Minna were saying. And I think that perhaps something that is important to bear in mind is that organizations at this time and, and, and they uh, what we are competing the most is for the talent. And then it is a matter of fact that it's talent who are driving organizations. So if we do have the technology, but we do not have the right team, it's not going to prosper. So I think we can think about it from the organizational perspective and just very pragmatically speaking, how that is going to translate into, for example, financial targets. But then we're going to be also thinking about the individuals and how attractive they are going to be to our organizations. And we have to be thinking about what we are offering and we are ultimately competing for their attention. And also it's a generational thing. This is not something that people think like, oh, if there is a strategy, that is a nice thing to have. Actually, talent are demanding organizations to have these things in place. So if you want to thrive as an organization, you, you want to have this in, in, on point. And I think that it also, because we spend so much time at work and because a lot of what 
uh, of who we are is also heavily influenced by what we do. We also want to have meaningful jobs and we also want to belong to meaningful organizations. And that ultimately also has an impact on the meso level. So if we think about societies, how we are going to be behaving in and out of work, it, it actually has a lot of impact. So of course, I'm very passionate about it. So you may think I'm biased, but I do think that when you are happy at work, then you have more meaningful relationships also when you are outside because you do not have to be dragging your job after that. And, and then ultimately you have more energy for, for everything else. So it sounds romantic, but it actually really, it, it does matter. Thanks. Thanks, Thanks. Thank for, for, for sharing that. You discussed a bit about, of course, uh, about the employees, about organizations, their own kind of like values, what they need to do uh, as a business, you know, strategy professional and also as, as a DEI consultant, uh, helping and supporting organizations to sort of like make DEI their strategic priority. Uh, my question, at least, yes, it's following up on that one is, is what do you think are the key elements or, or let's say the components, you know, um, in implementing DEI strategies in organizations overall? Yeah, I, I love this question because I think that that is a question that I get a lot actually from, from, from the people with whom I work with. And I think that uh, there are several elements that are important, but I think one of them that you can't miss is to have the leadership commitment. So for example, if you have a lot of the organization or the people in the team demanding for these changes to happen, but then this is not coming from all levels, it's not going to happen. So I would say that leadership commitment is one of them. Then I do think that uh, for that, you also have to have a team that is aware of actually what are the importance of things, how to drive the change and what are the elements to go through. Um, I think it's also important to, to remember that if you want to make an impact, you actually need to know where you are standing at and where you want to go. So you will need data. And then after that, you will need to be setting goals and then a timeline, uh, accountability on people. So this is actually, of course, that speaks itself for a strategy. But um, what is also important is to think about this actually needs resource allocation. And I don't only mean, of course, you may need to make some uh, monetary investments, but I'm talking about time, I'm talking about a team, and, and just in general to have the elements, the access to the knowledge, the goals, the roadmap, and these kinds of things that will actually ultimately guide you. Uh, I believe that I haven't met yet an organization which is saying like, I will not be doing this, it's not a, a something that is important. But then the resource allocation is something that we are lagging behind because this is rather new in, 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 in the organizations, for example, here in Finland. So to summarize, we need leadership commitment, uh, resource allocation, data, clear goals, and a timeline. Yeah, thanks, Yasmit, on that one. I, I, I want to bring, yes, uh, Sumit on this one. Sumit, uh, how does this, you know, um, overall, how does, you know, this points, you know, yes, you mentioned about the, you know, leadership commitment, resource allocation, uh, and also about the having the data uh, for measuring the, I, for someone like yourself, you know, who has a long experience building diversity in society, and also uh, the first head of the IBF Sipstead and who is responsible, you know, for ensuring that Sipstead has, has all the right practices in place, how do you overall see, what do you think are the key, you know, are these key components, what Yesmith mentioned are, are very relevant or do you have uh, some more, for example, from your own experiences? Mm. Uh, no, uh, I can just echo what Yesmith said, I uh, totally agree. There's kind of, uh, uh, it's impossible to challenge that. I think uh, it is the key components and I think it's also the key components for for any transformation, right? So, so uh uh, in my previous job, also I worked with transformation, and that was digital and innovation, right? That was also the same dilemmas, right? We do. How do you measure innovation? How do you? It's a new agenda. How do you actually allocate resources? How do you get all on board? Everyone agrees that it's important, right? So, um, I think maybe one of the things uh, which I think uh, is maybe key here is that. Um, maybe we tend to when we talk about this uh we the 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 the, the kind of um goals or the 
the the kind of output of this work if you don't see it right in front of you that some people just say that yeah, you know I don't need to kind of understand this because it makes sense for me that if we are a diverse uh, team of people and this diverse team of people actually dare to share, right? Then you will, uh, of course, have better products. Uh, and I think, uh, but I think that for many people, um, it still is not a priority because the productivity, the, the kind of... Uh, increased innovation or product development is a black box uh, in the far future uh, so 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 for for me it has is uh, also been important to actually take that closer to us and say okay how can we actually uh, create more uh, of that value creation today so rather turn it around and say we'll start with that today as well. So maybe in addition to what Yesmit said, we we've actually tied in the 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 product development also, uh, and I think also um, uh, we have uh, also uh, looking at the processes of the company to ensure that all processes are kind of we have a dib or diversity inclusion and belonging filter on the process to ensure that. Uh, whether you attract talent, whether you rec when you recruit them, upskill, develop them, or compensate them, that this will be sort of uh, a, a sort of a neutral process, uh, neutral in the sense that uh, we will create uh, equal opportunities for everyone, uh, and that means that uh, we don't necessarily treat everyone equal because we're we 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 can't be colorblind or gender blind uh, in this work or in our companies because we are different so so the processes and then the lastly i think what also yes met uh, spoke about but just to build on i think it's the governance so what kind of you know with, with us having over 55 different brands uh the 55 different cultures and 55 different kind of uh, uh, rationales for why people go to work um that makes it more complex. So we need to also fix the model of how do you uh, take this uh, knowledge uh, and cascade it in the organization and how do you make that movement happening uh, in all the brands. So making uh, uh, different, uh, for instance, uh, we are making a diversity, inclusion, and belonging global team in order to ensure that so that all brands are covered and represented uh, in this agenda and that these people are uh, part of the management in each of the brands to ensure that it's kind of high priority and uh, uh, covered by the people that uh, actually are sit on the top of the brands. So, so yeah, uh, overall, I agree to what Yesmit said and just uh, some uh, additional reflections uh, to that. Thanks. Thanks so much for sharing that. Um, quite quite many things that has been brought up by both Yesmith and, and uh, um, Sumit on this one. Uh, the last part, at least, uh, Sumit, you highlighting that each branch of, of organization need to really understand that that DEI is a high priority. I want to bring uh, Minna in on in, in this one. Minna, you 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 have been in Kone for quite many years and also responsible for leading Kone's you know global DEI DNI initiatives. How do you see, you know, the whole thing working, working in this in terms of, you know, implementing this kind of like DEI strategy, especially uh, when you have like so many branches and so many uh, employees working, working in different parts of the world? How do, how do you manage that? Well, that is a, is a challenge in a sense. And um, I think um, what Yesmit also said, that that's how we, we got started. So we, we um, first of all, um, I have to agree with the leadership commitment that is essential. Uh, so really to make sure that um, they are uh, on board and driving this topic is of course of huge importance. And I think what helps there is like was already said, the data and the clear goals that, are, that we have set for ourselves. So that kind of building on the, on the case and, and setting a clear direction and vision as to where we want to be going. And uh, we started by doing a uh, global um, DEI maturity assessment. So we wanted to understand where we are at the moment. We had a feeling where we are, but we just wanted to have some data to really show where we are and benchmark against other, other industries. And, and that was a kind of a really helpful starting point, which I would recommend to do, like Yesmit also said. 
because based on that, then we work together with different stakeholders in the company to create a global DEI strategy. And that based on that strategy, we then create it or will create each year a uh, roadmap of actions that we are taking so that that strategy help us focus on the areas that we identify that are, are important in strengthening DEI. And, um, and I think um, one of the, of course, important thing is that, okay, we have a global strategy, we have global roadmaps, but this is a topic that you need to drive locally. So uh, then of course, it's really um, important that all countries have their own uh, DEI plans so that it's aligned with the global strategy. But then again, um, it is taking into account the differences, uh, the local differences that there are, for instance, in legislations and in the DEI maturity overall. So in 60 countries, as you can imagine, there are, there are differences there. So it's a, it's a challenge to have this kind of one global message out. And maybe to highlight, um, one important thing in our DEI strategy is what we call a strategic intent. And by this, we mean that this DEI is something that we feel that has to be embedded to our, our overall company strategy and that we have done. So it's there, it's part of our strategy, it's part of our culture, it's part of our sustainability work, and, and it's even embedded into our values. So that way, it's not something separate or something that HR is driving, but something that is there kind of embed it uh, to what we do every day. And that, like Sumit also mentioned, that's also something that then in HR, we need to work to get to embed into different practices and processes and, and that way ensure that we are living, living that DEI strategy, uh, really. And um, yeah, I think data is, is important. And of course, then following up with data is, is the, the uh, also important so that we know, are we progressing? Are the efforts that we are taking, are they really working? And what kind of outcomes do we get? So I think at least those, those are the things that we've been kind of focusing on the implementation. As, and of course, then communications and training, I think that goes without saying that we started with the top leadership to make sure that they have the, the capability and the commitment there to then try this um, uh, in their own organizations. All right, uh, that, that was really, really well, well put, put on that one. Thanks so much for, to, do, to all of you for, for bringing those things. At least uh, what we came up with, uh, with the key elements are, you know, you, we discussed about leadership commitment. We also discussed about having the data, like Mina, you suggested, having the data to, to kind of like benchmark with others, like how are you doing compared to the other, com you know, other competitors in the, within the market and also uh, working, working with the different stakeholders, uh, so you mentioned about product development, having the right processes, governance, legislations, also did came 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 into the discussion. Uh, now, just thinking about you know the, the next phase of the panel discussion that you know now we have identified some of the key elements of, of implementing the uh, strategies on organization, but also at the same time, uh, even though that organizations do understand that these are the elements, but they are having some challenges implementing them. I want to bring Sumit in on this one. Sumit, based on the discussion and of course your, your own understanding on this topic, what do you think are the main challenges or let's say the, the barriers faced in, implement, in implementing you know, this kind of uh, changes right from the very start of, you know, uh, of, of the organization journey? Or even we, can, we could also kind of like put in, for example, when companies are already having, you know, at the very stages of, of their DEI journey. So I mean, what, what would you say on that one? Yeah, I can only build on uh, what has already been said, actually, because it's, uh, you know, when we say, uh, talk about resource allocation, it actually boils down to pri priority. How high priority is it? Yes, everyone understand. This makes sense. This is important. And then I think often we get the answer, but uh, Right now, we have to kind of we have to prioritize the, a bit there, <laughs> uh, right? We, uh, right now, we have to prioritize innovation, or right now we have to prioritize ten other things, uh, and we will of course do this, and then that's sort of the eleventh priority. Uh, so I think that's a challenge, uh, uh, and I think uh, uh, why it is a challenge, uh, it's several reasons. I think one of them is like what I spoke to earlier that the the, the 
the the output is such a kind of long term output, and you can't actually see it and feel it. Uh, so so I think that we tend to think that that we we need to fix things that are important right now. Um, and that builds upon, I think, uh, maybe something that um, uh, we need to think about or should think about when we build up the competence or training for our leaders. Uh, because I think there's different kind of understanding for this, right? Something is like, if you have felt exclusion, you might be more passionate about inclusion, right? Because you felt it on your body, you've seen how how uh, painful it is. You've seen that uh, it's not right. Uh, and you see how it takes down the potential of you as a person. Um, so, but what do you do if you haven't felt that? If you have, have uh, had power and privileges and you kind of don't see that happening or that see that that is the case, right? Uh, what, uh, what happens if you are, are colorblind or gender blind and try to say yeah but everyone are equal um i think that's the difficult part to take uh, uh, and i think that's the difficult part in a lot of leadership in a lot of organizations that the leadership have not actually felt exclusion themselves so they hear and they listen and they support it but they've not felt it so it's more uh, external factor pressure we do it because what will the brand be if we don't say that we focus on it or what will the brand be if we don't do something about it how will we know the talents look for this today so we need to do it we know that the governments are looking at this so the pressure is more external rather than internal and that's i think the main challenge and i think that needs to be incorporated a part of the competence lift if you haven't felt it we, you have to feel it through the training uh, and uh, feel it through the training doesn't necessarily mean that all the training should be inspiring and as emotional because we have to have the rational part as well it has to have substance uh, but it's about balancing those things uh, uh, and make sure that they go hand in hand uh, yeah at least uh, some of my uh, initial uh, reflections Thanks, thanks, Sumit, on that one. Uh, Sumit, you kind of like brought quite important points on this one, prioritizing, having long, long term output, and also understanding the privileges. And also, probably that also comes the thing that we discussed before the leadership commitment and, and, and then uh, those kind of things. I want to bring Minna in on this one. Minna, is this, is this something? Do you have the similar kind of like a thoughts on this one, or do you want to add up anything on this? Yeah, I, I have to say that well said, Sumit. I think that is is the case especially when when there are some some concepts or terms that people are not even familiar with uh, when it comes to DEI so it is maybe dif difficult for some leaders to start driving something that they don't fully understand so that's why of course creating that awareness and and making sure that people understand for instance privileges or uh, different gender um, uh, identities or, or whatever. Uh, so that I think that's why the, the, the whole awareness part is such an important thing. So I have to agree. But maybe from my perspective, the, the challenges that I wanted to rise uh, or, or raise is the what I already mentioned, the multicultural environment. That is a challenge when you start globally implementing something when there are so many different cultures and different maturities when it comes to DEI. So kind of getting that unified message globally out there is, is sometimes a challenge that we have to work on. And also the different um, uh, legislations. So what is required from the companies from the legal point of view, and then what is even considered illegal is different from country to another. So that's really kind of balancing what, what we are then doing, doing globally. And, um, and another point from, from a, maybe from more the data perspective is that, um, again, there are different legislations. So um, that we due to the fact that in some countries such as in Europe, the GDPR, uh, that this applies to Finland, we're not allowed to collect certain type of DEI data, which would be of course helpful for us to understand how diverse we are. But for example, when it comes to uh, ethnicities, we can't collect that data and we then therefore can't really know for sure how, how diverse we are in terms of, of that um, diversity aspect. 
and that of course um, uh, then makes it difficult for us to, like said, understand the current situation. And then, of course, there are sometimes these anonymous surveys that we can do to collect that type of data. But then we also see that in uh, sometimes people are not willing to uh, disclose this kind of data. And again, we don't have um, um, enough data to draw conclusions. And 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 that's a that's a one challenge that we have recognized and and have to have to tackle somehow. Yeah. Thanks, Minna. Quite, quite many things things to be done in, in, in that sense. I want to bring Yasmith in on, on this one. Yasmith, you have been, of course, helping and, and supporting organizations to really understand what are the key priorities. What are the challenges? Is this something, you know, we kind of like uh, Sumit, both Sumit and Minna listed quite many different things in terms of, you know, leadership commitment, in terms of having the data, in terms of, you know, uh, having uh, like what is right for the company. What, do you, what are your experiences on and what are your thoughts, for example, what kind of like things that come up on those discussions when you're having, having with those companies? Yes, uh, thank you. Uh, well, I think there are several that I have observed, but for example, one of them that is uh, quite common is that organizations don't exactly know where to get started. And it happens when sometimes, for example, you have a lot of motivation and then you may even have an employee resource group where they are pushing for it and then everyone is like, yeah, yeah, let's go for it. But then they don't exactly know where to get started. And then it can be actually going from a very high motivation to actually being like, well, actually, we may not be able to do anything about it. Uh, but I will go back to that one because I think that what happens oftentimes is also that when we are highly motivated, we want to sort of jump into the planning stage and then to jump into the let's set goals. And then I think that is a, a sort of uh, not set for success from the perspective that if you do not have actually the level of knowledge, if you do not have the level of awareness of what you actually will need to be doing, then setting goals is an evil exercise really. Um, and then of course you will not be able to achieve such goals and then you lose motivation. And because of that, I think that perhaps one of the biggest challenges that people do not have access or organizations do not have access to, to information and to specific data as of where to focus. And I think that uh, why we don't have data is for several reasons. I believe that Mina actually brought up a very important topic about what is actually the sort of information that we are allowed to collect, who is allowed to collect this information. But still, there are ways to actually collect, for example, sentiments and experiences. And then, for example, this also relates to what Summit was saying, that if you in a position of privilege are unable to see something, if you do not possess the data, you will not be able to do anything about it. And it, it's not about your lack of commitment. It has to do with, we can't see what we can't see. That is a matter of fact. And because of that, we need the data. Um, I also think that uh, oftentimes organizations think about this as a sort of a checklist uh, kind of action plan where they are saying like, okay, now we have a anti-harassment policy, yes code of conduct, yes, uh, a goal, but, but it does not work like that. There isn't such a thing as a magic formula. And especially when you don't have the data, you don't know where to, to focus. And, and then also, I believe that when we think about diversity, we oftentimes think about one aspect of diversity. And then that is something that we may be thinking about gender, we may be thinking about internationalization, it depends but we actually have to think about it holistically. And I insist for that we need the data. And last, last but not least, I believe that also um, what, what oftentimes is the, the biggest challenge is that organizations may still think about diversity, equity, and inclusion as a nice to have sort of thing or as a side activity. But DEI has to actually be embedded in this strategy if you really want it to succeed. If you have it as a, an activity, as a something that you're driving because you want to do well, it will not succeed because it has to be strategic and you have to actually be thinking about what the impact is going to look like for the organization and for the individuals so that you actually want to push for it. So I would say that perhaps uh, to summarize <laughs> everything I just said, perhaps the biggest barrier is that we don't know where to place it in the strategy. Uh, and as a consequence, we do not have access to, to, to for example, data 
and, and specific plants. Thanks, Yasmith. Uh, you mentioned you, you you touched upon a bit on the consequences part. I want to you know uh, expand it a bit on this one. Uh, I want to bring in Sumit first on this. Uh, of course. Uh, like Yasmith said, um, the I uh, shouldn't be any more as as nice to haves or or as a checklist on your on your on your agenda. Uh, Sumit, what do you think? You know, what are the long term consequences if, for example, organizations fail to implement or ignore implementing this DEI in organizations? I think it's also something we've been touching upon today, and also shared in the in the initial or in the intro. I think it's about staying relevant, right? It's about having the best talent, uh, uh, attracting the best talents, and uh, utilizing or optimizing the best talents, right? It's about having the best products. The best products are not made by homogeneous teams. And it's about creating uh, friction or con positive friction in teams. And that means you need different uh, perspectives in the room. Uh, so I think if you don't do that, you will not have the best products. You will not be able to innovate and you will not have the best talents. So, so, so I think that's sort of the scene here. Uh, and then you can, uh, to be more specific, right? Uh, let's take the, the, the um, uh, news media. For instance, right? We know that in the uh, there was a research done by World Economic Forum where we see that the trust uh, for, for for the media has gone down the past year in uh, some major uh, some major major countries. Uh, for instance, UK and US. So we trust the news less. What we see amongst the multicultural or uh, population is that uh, what they state uh, there uh, there is no trust. Th the relationship have to be built. So what does that mean? Uh, that means that we are not actually, uh, the news is not read by this population. Uh, uh, so we are not relevant for them. That might be a democratic challenge, right? Uh, and then what does that mean? Maybe we don't actually understand that po population. We don't understand what their needs are we don't understand what they read we don't understand how they read right so so uh that's actually where also they introduced that we need to uh, incorporate uh, um, design thinking much more we need to because often we tend to when we ask questions uh whether it's research whether it's journalism whether it's uh, uh innovating we go there with pre-assumptions and we get a confirmation of that, and then we go back. But we don't really open up and try to understand the pain and gains for the people we speak to. Uh, and that then uh, results in the product not being relevant. And I think not being relevant in the future is one thing. Uh, I think news media have a challenge to be relevant today. So, so the, 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 the challenge is actually just in front of us. So, so that's an example for one of the verticals, at least. I think uh, uh, that uh, says something about the, the, the bigger challenge here. Thanks, Sumit, for sharing that. How about Mina? What, Mina, what are your, what are your thoughts as, as someone who is, has been leading, you know, uh, CONES DI initiative, uh, global initiative? What are your thoughts on this one? What, are, what could be the long term, you know, uh, consequences in terms of your own organizations and also organizations working in these in this areas? Yeah, I have to agree again with Sumit. I think uh, the, the long-term effects uh, definitely are, are um, affecting, for instance, our competitiveness. So if we, um, if we ignore DEI, um, I believe that we will have problems in, first of all, attracting people, because this is something that people expect from the companies nowadays. I, I think I've read some um, research that, you know, culture is one of the, the main things nowadays when people decide whether or not they want to join a company. So that is a huge thing, of course. And, and then uh, considering the people that we have already, retaining that talent is really important. So we know we are currently talking about this great resignation uh, globally. So to be really able to retain the talent we need to be uh, more inclusive. We need to be able to uh, have uh, different kind of talents within. And of course, um, um, we know that this, um, you know, lacking of diversity and lacking di in inclusion 
will eventually lead to uh, negative impacts on, on the innovation, the, the, the well-being, um, engagement, everything mentioned already before. And kind of have to echo with what Sumit said about the, um, the, the product and the development. Um, we also see that one of the biggest things that, uh, or one of the ambitions that we have uh, when it comes to DEI is to be as diverse as our customers are. So to really understand our customers and end users, so the people using our equipment, we need to be diverse ourselves so that we can offer that type of solutions to our, our customers and we can offer the best, what we call people flow experience to, to our um, then end users. So yeah, yeah I think, I think um, that, yeah. that then, you know, eventually all that, if we ignore that, then that will have an effect on our in uh, profitability also, so not just the um, engagement and the innovation and performance, yeah. Yeah, and I think that's very much, very well ties. I mean, I think the, the last point that you made in terms of, you know, having uh, diverse, uh, you know, kind of like a profile within the organization so that we can uh, have, we can reach out to diverse customers uh, that we have within the, you know, that uh, customer list, for example, and that very much, you know, kind of ties what Sumit also mentioned beforehand about, you know, having the, the leadership really understanding and really feeling uh, that part so that they can implement those DEI changes. I want to bring now, uh, yes, Smith, on this one, going into the solutions, but of course we went, we, we uh, already had a discussion of what are the key elements, then we also discussed about now, just now about the long-term consequences, what are the things, what are the barriers, challenges the organizations are facing, and what if the organizations are not taking or, or ignoring implementing the, uh, what happens, but maybe a bit more solution oriented on this one. Uh, yes, Smith, uh, what do you think, like what are the steps, what steps do you suggest organizations, you know, to take, uh, you know, to drive the change? What are your thoughts on this one? Yes, thank you. I think that perhaps the very first steps, uh, or like actually not perhaps, the very first step is to have and increase the awareness that exists within the organization. This goes all for the team, but very, very particularly also for the for the leadership. Uh, I was reading some comments in the chat section, and then, for example, some people are talking about how sometimes uh, some leaders lack the empathy and these kinds of things. So I believe the more aware we are, the more we are aware of the impact that our uh, behavior and acts or lack thereof uh, are going to have as an organization. So I think that that is something that we want to, to increase at all costs, to increase awareness, but not only stay there, because I think that oftentimes what we do is that we go for awareness, we read a ton of articles, we are very motivated, and then there isn't an action. So what I believe is, again, uh, I would go for increasing awareness, then I would go for measuring what is the state of DEI in the organization. And then, because that is oftentimes a very uh, good reality check, like we are often very proud of, like our team is very diverse. True, and how happy are they about the environment, for example. Uh, so I think that uh, I will go for awareness, measuring, and then then creating a plan based on that measurement and then based on what you want to look like as an organization. So always think about this DEI as a topic that is evolving super fast. So don't think that whatever you are setting up, up for today is going to be enough for tomorrow. So when you are creating a roadmap, you also have to be futuristic and you want to be creating it as a competitive advantage. So in that sense, I think that your plan has to be something that is both realistic, but also ambitious and then a sort of um, um, vision leading, so to speak. Thanks, thanks Esme, for sharing that. Uh, and I think those are really, really good points on on on, on what you mentioned uh, in terms of um, you know you know having having that, having that commitment, uh, creating that the uh, journey uh, awareness building and stuff. Uh, I want to bring Sumit on this one. Sumit, you also mentioned about you know having uh, this long term output being futuristic. Uh, what do you think, like in your opinion, are, are other solutions, or do you want to highlight some of the solutions uh, that that yes, Smith just mentioned? Yeah, I think uh, I agree. Uh, you need to have a roadmap. You need to be committed for a longer term. Uh, the, of course, that's, uh, I think, the foundation. And uh, I also think you uh, 
you need to start uh, you you have to prioritize right you have to do something on the longer term some bigger commitments that uh, it takes more and then you have to do some smaller steps as well to get started so doing both i think is uh, is important uh, and i think um, um, because you will not also i think it's important also to look at this as uh, more uh, experimentation mode right with the dni because uh, um i don't believe in the you know you often tend to see kind of processes over four years and you say that first year we create awareness second year we create uh, commitment third year we create kind of disruption or something uh, because uh, when you are on le uh, le uh, year three maybe half of the resources have been shifted out right so 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 you need to kind of experiment or continuously i think and you also the reason i also call it uh, experimentation is that because uh it's very immature area and it's a very complex area so so you need to experiment uh, uh and you need to fail a lot and learn from that uh, i think that's sort of the the, the uh how i see it um and um then I think, uh, like on the, the the training part, you have some bigger things, of course, that takes time to build that competence. But what you can do easily and quickly is to set up uh, some platform, some safe rooms for people with different perspectives, where you can have listening groups, you can get in the, the management there, the management can own it, you can uh, have this space where you can share the challenges or being different. Uh, uh, and uh, it, it also makes other people learn from it. And I think uh, um, a lot of the competence, a lot of perspectives around this is in the organization. I think the organization itself are much more mature and experts on this than me, but we need to pick it up. Uh, and, and I think uh, uh, also uh, additionally, uh, I think the nature of DNI. Uh, what is uh, so beautiful about it it's uh, that you have uh, of course you need to have the top-down focus that's what we're talking about now when we talk about priority resources training that's a top priority but i think uh, there's a huge bottom-up uh, priority for this so utilize that bottom-up uh, uh, capacity i think that will drive a bigger change because that will challenge me uh, right because people see perspectives i don't see uh, and uh, that makes us pick it up prioritize it and leaves us no way to not prioritize it because it comes from the organization so so balancing those uh, two things i think i think uh, um is uh, is a uh, key yeah Thanks, Sumit, on this one. Uh, quite many things uh, also added on this one, like prioritizing and stuff. Uh, this is something that also ties what Minna said before in terms of you know prioritizing, in terms of uh, creating that long-term effective initiatives and, and competitiveness and attracting the right people and diverse people within the organizations. Uh, Minna, is there something that you would like to add up on this one uh, on, on what other steps can be taken or, or highlight some of the few things that, that for example, you have been doing? Yeah, I think maybe building on what Sumit was talking about bottom up, I think we've talk, we talked a lot about the leadership commitment here, but one important aspect to get everybody on board and get those kind of uh, diverse voices amplified is uh, employee resource groups. And that's something that we've started to work on more systematically now. So that's maybe a, a, an aspect that we could bring here. So if there are some people on the line that are not familiar with the employee resource group. So these are now um, employee led uh, groups that um, help us uh, in the company to drive DEI together with our employees. And typically these groups are, uh, you know, um, you know, the, the members of this group share a certain characteristic such as gender or religion or sexual orientation or, or something like that. So what we have had uh, locally, these kind of uh, ERGs, as we say, uh, for, for some time, but now we've started to also establish global ERGs that are then working together with these local groups. And, and there, for instance, now we have put together our first employee resource groups for women, and then we are working on the established one for the LGBTIQ plus community. So I think that is really important because uh, the, we want to involve our employees. That's how we see our culture also, that we want to make sure that 
you know, everybody has a voice and we can work on this topic together. So that's that's maybe something that um, I would add on. And and um, and also maybe one one more uh, point is that I like what you Sumit said about really working with the long term and the, and the short term. So we need to have goals that are quite, quite ambitious, but at the same time, make sure that how do we make these small changes in the everyday working? And for that, for instance, we have created some practical tools. So for instance, we have a DNI toolkit that has some tips like what you can do in a meeting or if you're a recruiting manager, what you can take into account when you are recruiting. So just really practical, small tips that hopefully will help us be more inclusive. Absolutely. Thanks. Thanks so. Thanks so much, Mina, for sharing those. Uh, we've got about now, you know, four to five minutes. I still want to get back to Sumit on this one. Um, of course, you know, uh, understanding what the other companies are doing, what are the other in, in kind of initiatives the other companies are doing, uh, is always something that companies can look up to and also try, you know, try to create some their own processes uh, for implementing this 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 sort of like DEI initiatives. Uh, Sumit, in at Sipstead, you know, what is your organization doing in terms of what are the different practices? What are the different initiatives that you are practicing at, at, at uh, Safestead in terms of imp implementing this kind of like a DEI in organization? Uh, no, so, so, so I think it's very um, fragmented actually right now. And that's what we're trying to gather, right? So, so uh, in some organizations, they have uh, put diversity competence as a priority so they're building up that competence building up that workforce building up that into the product so so that's sort of in some brands that's happening and other uh, brands we have a, a diversity inclusion belonging council actually driving the agenda uh, whereas uh, some organization are trying to lift and say we need to do something um, uh, and in some organizations uh, there might not be that much, but but it's very fragmented. It's a lot of things happening. But what I see is that before joining the company, I had requests from their brands and organization that the, we we need uh, we need your help. We need to know what to do, how to do it, right? So so there's a huge pull here, and I think that's a privilege of working with this right now. This is. Uh, uh, and that's how we will work, right? The the we will make global frameworks, global uh, plans and roadmaps. Uh, but the ones that pick uh, put their hands up first is the ones that will get the highest support. And I think uh, uh, it's actually a time and an era where, where that works uh, because it's actually a fight to get the help for those that are mature. Uh, and uh, I think it's important to help those that really want to drive this rather than trying to force uh, companies now because everyone will come there. Uh, so so that's sort of, uh, uh, yeah, maybe very general kind of answer, but, but, but that's uh, what we're doing. But uh, my job is to gather it into a global sort of a setup and global way of work um, to, to really take shipstead to the next uh, the next stage or the next stages uh, with regards to this. Absolutely, I think Sumit, that, that that is similar to what you mentioned before, like creating the right processes uh, that has long term effect. I want to bring Mina in on this one. Mina, you mentioned already a bit about the ER, creating the ER, setting up the ERGs, and also uh, creating the DEI toolkits. Is there anything else, other initiatives, other kind of practices that Kone is practice, practicing at this at this moment, or anything that's included on the D, your, your overall DEI strategy? Hmm. Uh, there are a lot of different projects that we have ongoing, but maybe now that we um, we are all, uh, at the moment planning the Pride Month, which is coming, so I can bring up the uh, partnering. So um, I think that is a helpful uh, way of getting more understanding on certain topics and getting support in, in uh, increasing DEI around certain aspects of diversity. So for instance, we have partnered with Workplace Pride, which is an organization for company, um, you know, international organization for companies to join. And we've also endorsed the UN standards for conduct. So these are the kind of ways, um, kind of partnerships that help us then also develop our, for instance, in this case, LGBTIQ plus inclusion. So that's, that's something that um, I have felt that is, has been useful. All right. Thanks, it's 10 o'clock, uh, we're right on time. 
Uh, but yeah, I just, just want to thank again uh, to all the speakers, Sumit, Min, and also Yasmith for really uh, bringing up those valuable discussions and also uh, all to all the audiences for being really engaging on, on, on the section, chat section. Uh, we've shared the feedback form on the chat box, so please feel free to uh, fill it up. And also would love to know a bit more about, you know, your own feedback on how to improve uh, our events in the future. But yeah, thank you all once again uh, here from Inclusive and also have a lovely rest of the day and also the weekend and hope to see you all in our future events. But yeah, that's me and that's us. Thanks so much and have a wonderful day. Thank bye you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. bye. bye.